Romans 14, verses 12 through verse 22. The word of the Lord today reads from the King James text. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably? Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let me read that to you again. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, Savior, Redeemer, friend, we love you, Lord. We thank you, God, for the wonderful presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel today in the house of God. You're present today, Lord, to comfort. You're present today, Lord, to encourage. I feel the anointing of God is present to heal, to deliver, to save to reclaim the backslider. You're here today, Lord, to do these things. If we have a need, God, we might lay it at this moment at your feet. For the hem of your garment is within reach. And if we will just believe, we might receive that for which we have need. Lord, as a minister of the gospel, I need the touch of God this hour. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I've been doing this for many, many, many years. And I am persuaded today more than I've ever been persuaded that the preacher of the gospel must be anointed of God if they are to offer anything to the people of God that might benefit them. Oh, Master, today let the Word of God go forth with power and great glory. Let it go forth in love. Help me to speak what you'd have me to speak. And Lord, by all means, help me to remain silent where it is imperative that I remain silent. 
We ask it all and none other than Jesus' precious name today. Amen. Praise God and amen. I've got a lot of scripture in this message, so I'm going to have to stay behind the pulpit as much as I can and try to get through this in a reasonable amount of time. The most enduring struggle that Christian theology has faced from the beginning of this faith has been the contrast between the Old and the New Testaments. Many believers from the very beginning of the church have had a difficult time transitioning from law to grace. Paul addresses this issue in the 14th chapter of the book of Romans. He addresses with it the notion that while some may embrace the need for obedience to laws, others do not. He then goes on to say that this difference need not be divisive or destructive. We ought to care enough about one another as children of God so as not to allow such variations in convictions to divide and destroy us and our fellowship one with another. In the end, the Christian faith comes down to personal accountability. The tendency on the part of so many believers to stick their noses into the lives and the Christian walks of fellow believers is unnecessary and it is unacceptable. When we learn to mind our own business, we find harmony and peace that the Lord has called us to. Now there are a lot of people in the church today who call themselves Christians. They identify as believers and yet they are combative. They are argumentative, they are judgmental, they are critical. They constantly, constantly, constantly will debate and argue with other Christians, other people who profess Jesus Christ. And they will argue and they will debate and they will cause all kinds of strife and trouble over any number of issues because they have a difference of opinion and yet the Apostle Paul made it abundantly clear in our primary text today Romans chapter 14 verse 12 so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God this is a personal walk this is a walk that does not require you to answer for me or me to answer for you. I will answer for myself. If you disagree with something in my walk, so be it. Keep your mouth shut. One of the other things the Apostle Paul told us in our primary text today is let us not therefore judge one another anymore. It's not your job to sit in judgment of me. Mm -hmm. He said, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. It amazes me how many Christians absolutely, Tommy, do not for one second think there is anything wrong with them telling an LGBT believer, well, you can't 
be a Christian and be who you are. You can't be a Christian and be LGBT. You can't serve God. They don't think anything of discouraging people from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ because of some aspect of their living or some portion of their uh, humanity. They don't have a problem one with pronouncing judgment upon others because they don't agree with the conclusion that you've come to relative to that. Honey, it ain't your issue. Stay out of it. Mm -hmm. It amazes me how many Christians have opinions on issues that they will never in a billion years have to face. How many men have opinions on abortion? And they will never in this world ever have to make that decision. Am I telling the truth? Yes. How many women have opinion on abortion? And they're beyond childbearing years. They don't think anything at all of using birth control. They don't think anything all of, at all of preventing life from coming into existence in the womb. Oh no, although that is how God designed things to work, but they don't think anything at all of interfering with God's design. But we've got idiots in the church who have the gall to get up and say that wearing a mask is an infringement upon my liberty as an American because God designed this beautiful breathing mechanism and He's designed us to be able to breathe freely in it. Do you follow? What hypocrisy and what stupidity there is in the church. And you know what? You wouldn't sound half as dumb as you do if you keep your sweet old opinion to yourself. We are on the verge of civil war in America today. Go to a gun store. You can barely find most ammunition. I know because I own guns. I go to the gun range. I'm quite a good shot. I enjoy target shooting. Go to the gun stores. Go to the sporting goods stores and see what their ammunition shelves look like today. They are literally, folks, I kid you not, at one time they used to have rows, aisles, of ammunition. Now today they literally will have one little six or eight foot long area and it used to be they'd have easily eight or ten times that area devoted to ammunition. Now they have this little area and it is barren. Am I telling the truth, Tommy? Yep. You cannot find any of the more popular uh, ammunition. You won't find 9mm, you won't find 45, uh, you know, you, you can't find 22 ammunition for 20, and 22s are, are virtually toy guns, you know, and you can't even find 22 ammunition. We are being driven to civil war I'm going to say it today as plainly as I can say it because God called me to prophetic ministry and I can't, I just don't have time to play games and to, to not say what I need to say. I've been preaching for a long time, a long, long time, that the Republican Party in America wants a civil war. They want civil unrest and they want massive civil unrest. This then will give them the excuse to declare martial law and to establish uh, martial law and to do away with the Constitution. Folks, the Constitution of the United States of America serves no purpose whatsoever for the Republican Party and for right-wing extremists. It serves no purpose to them whatsoever. They hate the Constitution. They look at the Constitution as being nothing more 
been a hindrance to them. Mm -hmm. They don't like it. That's why they've spent so many years trying to find ways to explain their behavior and their conduct to try to make it look like they're being constitutionally devoted. But they're not. Oh, well, we believe that, you know, it should be interpreted according to the intention of the original writers. You know, it shouldn't be interpreted by modern standards. Uh, the Constitution doesn't grow. The Constitution doesn't evolve. Blah, blah, blah. Um, yes, it does. Our founders understood that. They knew that. They knew that with time things were going to change and they understood that. And if you want to go according to their original intent, their original intent was that you would read the Constitution as a living document and that you would interpret it and apply it according to the times in which you live. That was their original intent. But you have these right-wing lunatics, you have these religious lunatics who are trying to redefine and rewrite the way in which the Constitution is interpreted. And they're doing so because everything they want to do is contrary to the Constitution as it is written. And they know that. I'm going to say it plainly today. There are more registered Democrats in America than there are registered Republicans. It has been that way for many, many, many decades, going back to before World War II even. And the Republicans know this. There has been a decline in registered Republicans. More and more people are registering independent now. So the Republican numbers have been coming down. So have the Democrat numbers. Because a lot of people are choosing to be independent. That way they can go whichever route they want to go. Which they could do as a registered Democrat or re registered Republican anyway. But anyway, they, they feel like, you know, they... They identify better as independent. However, even with the numbers growing in the independent realm, there are still more registered Democrats than there are Republicans or independents. And the Republican Party knows this. This is why they are going so far out of their way to try to manipulate elections. This is why they are going so far out of their way to try to hinder people from being able to vote. This is why they are going out of their way to try to make it nearly impossible for minorities and the poor to vote because they know that these people in particular in this particular demographic are much more likely to vote Democrat than they are Republican. Folks, our country is under assault right now, and if you don't wake up and recognize what's going on, then one morning you're going to wake up, and our constitutional democracy will be no more. And we will have an oligarchy, we will have a country run by the elites up in Washington, we will have a country that is run by the religious, we'll have a theocracy, we will have a dictatorship, because oligarchies and theocracies love dictators that they think are working for them. And without fail, dictators always turn on those who help put them in power without fail. Our country is in desperate condition today, and I'm going to tell you a little secret. There's, there's a big reason why our country is in the shape it's in today. I'm going to say this as plain as I can say it. Because the majority of fundamentalists and evangelical preachers are false prophets, they're liars, they are sheep in... Uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. They are not preaching the Word of God. They are not being true to the Word of God. The message they preach is garbage. Mm -hmm. it says it. I don't know how much plainer I can say it, Tom. Said it. There are three things that are supposed to define the nature of the kingdom of God. 
And according to the Apostle Paul in our primary text today, if we follow after these things, listen, in verse 19 of our primary text, Romans 14, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. and things wherewith one may edify another. The church is supposed to be about peace. Paul said also in verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. In using this phrase, he is speaking of the law of Moses. He said the kingdom of God is not about the rules and regulations and dictates of the law of Moses. But, what is the kingdom of God about if it's not about rules and regulations? He said, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now listen to verse number 18. For he that in these things, what things? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things, what things? Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ, listen, is acceptable to God, but not just acceptable to God, but listen to this, and approved of men. Mm -hmm. Do you know if the church acted like the church is supposed to act, people would like us. Yep. They wouldn't hate us. They might hate our message. They might hate our Jesus. They might hate our religion. But they wouldn't hate us. They would not hate us. They would not despise us. Because if we acted like the church is supposed to act, if we lived like citizens of heaven, if we lived like we're supposed to live as citizens of the kingdom of God, there are three things that we would manifest. Righteousness. Peace. And joy in the Holy Ghost. Now I'm going to do some running through Scripture right now. Righteousness is most easily defined as simply doing right. God's people desire and seek to live righteous lives, to do right. Why do we do this? Because God said you go to hell if you don't know. We do so out of gratitude. For the salvation which our God has provided through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. We do not seek to live right to pay a debt, but rather as a way of saying thank you. Think about it. If someone took you into their home and provided you with food and shelter, asking for nothing at all in return or in payment, you'd be remiss not to show your gratitude by keeping your room clean, picking up after yourself, offering at least offering to do dishes or laundry. Am I telling the truth? Are they requiring this of you? No. But you do it not to pay your debt, not to earn your keep, but you do it as a means of saying thank you. If you have your own house and you want to live like a pig, if you have your own house and you don't want to do dishes and you don't want to do laundry and you don't want to pick up your room, then so be it. But this person, out of the goodness of their heart, has invited you into their home. Do you hear what I'm telling you? God has extended His grace toward us. He has provided a means whereby we might share eternity with Him in His presence and in gratitude and thanksgiving and appreciation for what He has done for us. We strive to do right because we know that doing right, righteousness, pleases Him. Am I telling the truth today? Yes. And makes Him happy. How much could you do to show your appreciation? Somebody say, well, how much would I have to do? 
if somebody invited. Listen, when I was 16 years old and I was renting a room in Fort Worth, Texas, the woman I was renting a room from got stone mad drunk. I had never seen drunkenness in my life. My father was a lot of things, a lot of evil things, bad things, but he was not a drinker. I never saw drunkenness in my entire life. This woman got so mad drunk and she turned into, now she and I got along famously when she was sober. But when she was drunk, Tommy, this woman turned into a lunatic. I, I couldn't believe I was looking at the same person. She became violent and she became nasty and me and the things she said to me were hurtful and accusatory and nasty and miserable but she and I got along great when she sobered she got stone drunk and threw me out of my house the place I was renting a room in you know there were other people that rented rooms from her too I wasn't the only one but she threw me out one night and I went back the next day. I, I was scared to death because I never. I was only at this point 17. I had never seen a drunk, and certainly not a mean drunk. And I went back, and I would, all I wanted to do was get my stuff and get out of there. I didn't want to spend another day in that place. I went back. I had a key. My room had an entrance from outside. I could go into my room without ever passing through her house. And I went into my room, and by God, the door flings open on the other side, you know, going into the house, because we shared the bathroom and all that. And there she stood, still, just drunker than a skunk, just screaming and hollering. And her niece was there with her, and her niece kept mouthing to me, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And this woman just saying, I'm just gathering up stuff, whatever I can gather, and I'm leaving. I'm walking down the street. I don't know where I'm going to go. I literally had nowhere to go. I had nothing, nowhere to go. That was probably one of the lowest points of my life at that point. I'm walking down the street and there was some people standing out on the lawn of this little house over here on the left-hand side of the road. Dolly's house where I was living was on the right-hand side of the road. This was down the road about two houses on the other side. And these people were standing on the lawn and they said, Honey, is Dolly on one of her drunks again? Is she on one of her benders? Well, apparently she had done this a number of other times. This wasn't the first. I'm crying. I'm so upset. I'm so nervous. I've never been around stuff like this. So it scared. It literally scared me to death. I've never been around drunkenness. To see somebody acting like a demon who, when she was sober, loved me to death, you know? It scared me to death. So anyway... I said, yeah, you know, blah, blah. And they said, well, do you know one time she almost went to jail for attempted murder because she actually hit a man with a hammer that was renting from her and, and cracked his skull. She said, oh, she's done this a number of times. I said, please don't take it personally, you know. And this lady, the, the, one of the ladies said to me, well, honey, where are you going? Do you have somewhere to go? Do you have somewhere to And I said, no, ma'am. I said, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm going to do. She said, well, you know what? She said, you can stay with me. You can stay with my husband and I. She said, we're retired and all that. She said, you can stay with us. Well, she said, I'll need to run it by my husband, but I'm sure he'll be agreeable. Well, I assumed she was from this house over here on the left, you know. So she said, why don't you come with me and we'll get you settled. So she begins to walk across the lawn and across the street to a house across the street. Well, we go into this house, and as we're going into this house, I thought to myself, there's an old man who sits out on the front lawn in a golf cart. And he always sits out in a golf cart. And he just sits there <laughs> on the golf cart. And when I'd be walking to work or going to church or whatever, I'd always pass him, you know. And so I would talk to him, because you know me, I'm very precarious and outgoing, and some people, Tommy, <coughs> think I talk too much and talk to too many people. Well, I would talk to this man, and sometimes he'd say, well, why don't you have a seat? And I'd sit with him on his golf cart and talk to him. Very nice man. We went into his house, and I thought, well, isn't that something? She said, my husband isn't home right now, but he'll be home in a little while. I said, he went to do, guess what? Play golf. So after a while, I, she brought me to a beautiful little bedroom and was telling me, make yourself at home, make yourself comfortable. 
and she told me, you know, they had like two or three kids, and all their kids had grown up and married, and all said, we haven't had anybody in the house, you know, for years. It'll be nice to have somebody blah, blah, blah. After a while, I heard the door open at the front, and, and I heard her starting to talk, and I heard a male voice. It was that old man. And she explained to him, Dolly's on one of her vendors, and I was so nervous, and I was kind of hiding. You know, I literally, I didn't want to go out until she talked to him. And she talked to him, and she told him what all happened. About it. And he said, well, you're going to just open our house up to a stranger? You're just going to let a stranger stay in our house? And say, what in the world's wrong with you? Blah, blah, blah. And he just started, you know. Finally, I, I thought I was going to have to just make my excuse and go, you know. I kind of peeked around the door of the kitchen. I looked out and I kind of stepped into the doorway. And he looked up and he saw me. He said, is this the young man you're talking about? Mrs. Daniels was her name. She said, yes. This fellow here? Yes. His name is Chuck. He said, I know Chuck. said, he... Oh, and there in the day go by when I was sitting out on the front lawn on my golf cart that he doesn't stop and talk. So one of the nicest, friendliest kids I've ever met, a good Christian boy, he said, of course he can stay with us. Of course. And I mean, his attitude changed like that. I stayed with those people. <laughs> it's a good memory for a month. At that time in my life, I was a slob. Tommy would argue, I'm still a slob, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> when I had my own place, I wasn't likely to do the dishes every day. I'd use every dish I had in the house. And then when the sink got so full, and hair started growing on stuff, and, and cups and saucers started walking around and talking, then I'd finally get some soap out and wash them. And she said, uh, I used to offer to do dishes. she tell me no. She says, Mrs. Daniels, oh, honey, no, you don't need to do dishes. She said, I do dishes. And this is back in the, the day. This is before everybody in town had dishwashers. You know, she did them by hand. Say, oh, honey, that's fine. Thank you for offering, you know. But I'd offer to help set the table. I'd make my room. I made my bed. I never made my bed when I had my own place, but I made my bed. I made sure my clothes weren't on the floor. Tommy said, hmm, why can't he do that for me? I went out of my way to be as good a house guest as I could. My mother sent me some money to come back home to Connecticut because honestly, after my experience with Dolly, I was so terrified. All I wanted to do was get home. I was like, God have mercy. If I run into one more human being like this, I don't know what I'll do. I, I never had been around that kind of stuff, you know? My mother sent me some money to come home on the bus, and, and Mrs. and Mr. Daniels took me in their living room, and they said, Chuck, honey, listen. You told us that you felt like God called you to Texas, and He brought you here. They said, if you want to stay, you're free to stay with us. You're welcome to stay with us. They said, you have been an impeccable house guest. You've been wonderful. You're not any problem in the world. We feel like we've got our, our son back in the house. They said, you're welcome to stay with us. You do not have to go back. Well, back in those days, I was very insecure and very... Uh, I had a lot of issues from growing up the way I grew up. And I just felt like, you know, everybody I ever knew, based on the way my father treated me and all that, that eventually I'd wear out my welcome and they weren't going to think so highly of me, you know. So I just said, no, no, I'll go back to Connecticut. I'll go back to Connecticut. I shouldn't have, but I'm not going to go there. But I did. Long story short, they didn't ask me to do one bloody thing to pay or repay them for allowing me to stay in their home, feed me the whole nine yards. But I had enough sense in my head to express my gratitude through my conduct. And I tell the truth. Right. That is what righteousness is for a believer, okay? 
Our true righteousness comes by faith in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ. But we can strive to live like Him in appreciation and gratitude for His love toward us. The little woman who washed the Lord's feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair is said by the Lord to have expressed much love. Why? Because she had been forgiven much. In Luke 7, 47, the Word of God declares, Wherefore I say unto thee, Jesus speaking, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So when people ask, well, how much appreciation should I show? How much should I do to show an appreciation? Well, really, it depends on how much you appreciate. How grateful are you? Because obviously, the more grateful you are, the more you're likely to do. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. In Romans 4, uh, verses 1 3, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So we're not working off our debt, because if we're working off our debt, then it's not the grace of God that has provided salvation for us. It's our works that has provided salvation. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So we live a life where we seek to do right. We seek, we strive to live righteously. Not as a means of paying a debt. Not as a means of paying God back for what he did for us, but rather as a way of saying thank you and expressing our gratitude and our appreciation. In Colossians 2, 6 and 7, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. In other words, showing gratitude. Amen. Amen. In Philippians 4 and 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. Paul said, as a believer, even when you pray, even when you go to God with a need, even when you approach the Lord and you're requiring or needing something, he said, always go with gratitude first. Amen. Amen. Don't go to God, you know, as if you're entitled, but go to God first with gratitude. Gratitude ought to uh, dictate everything we do and everywhere we go and how we conduct our business and how we conduct our lives, we ought to be living in a manner that expresses gratitude to God for what Jesus did for us at Calvary. But see, if you don't feel like Jesus did a whole lot for you, if you started out so holy and so righteous, see, that's the problem with a lot of people in the church today. They forgot where they come from. And then there's other people who they didn't come that far. I know people 
who started out perfectly nice people. I know people who never did a whole lot of nothing bad, who never did a whole lot of, of sinning, as it were. And when God saved them, there wasn't a whole lot of change that needed to take place in their life because they already lived a peaceable life. They already lived a, a, a moral, decent life. But then you got somebody like me who in my backslid state did some terrible, horrible, hideous things. And when God restored me, hallelujah, and brought me back into the fold, I'm here to tell you today I'm grateful every day. Because mm -hmm. like the old song said, if you could see where Jesus brought me from to where I am today, then you know just why I love Him so. There are people out there, you can't be who you are and be a child of God. Oh, my friend, shut your mouth. Be silent, devil. I'm here to tell you, you don't know what I used to be compared to what I am today. Mm -hmm. Don't you tell me I can't be a child of God. Righteousness is one of the three defining attributes of God's kingdom. The desire, the willingness, the pursuit of doing right. Secondly, the Apostle Paul said that peace is an attribute of the kingdom of God. Above all else, a child of God is defined by their desire to follow after peace. Mm -hmm. They are not raucous. They are not argumentative. They are not debaters. Nor are they violent. They seek above all else to follow the path of peace. Now run with me through the Word of God. Matthew 5 and 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. Listen. For they shall be called the children of God. If you're not a peacemaker, my friend, if you're argumentative, if you're raucous, if you're a debater, if you're violent, if you're, uh, you know, somebody that, that lives that kind of a life, I don't care if you call yourself a believer or not, I don't care if you identify as a Christian or not, you are not a child of God. Because children of God are peacemakers. Yes, amen. John 14, 27, peace. I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. See, the world gives you peace that is conditional. Jesus said, I'm giving you my peace. Not the kind of peace the world gives. The only time you feel peace in the world is when there is peace. Hello now. Jesus said, no, you're going to feel peace even when there ain't no peace. Even when there's struggle going on. Even when there's trouble. Even when uh, there's fighting. Even when there's war. Even when there's a threat. You're going to feel peace. He said, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. And yet there are pastors in churches all over America today who are going to preach their people into a state of terror. You need to be worried. You need to be afraid. You need to be concerned because blah, 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 blah. Honey, I don't know what message you're preaching, but it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel of Jesus Christ is a message of peace. The gospel of Jesus Christ says, let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. So the Lord's saying, in the world this will be going on, but in me you'll have peace. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Romans 1 and 7. To all that be in Rome. Paul begins his letter to the Romans. Beloved of God. Called to be saints. Grace to you. And peace. From God our Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ. Read every single greeting and every single epistle and you will without fail see the word peace in the greeting. Every single epistle. 
That's how important peace is to the church. That's how important peace is to God's people. Paul says, I wish for you above all things, peace. Peace be unto you. Peace you constantly see in the greeting. Read them. I don't have time tonight to read them all, but read them. Romans 8, 5, and 6. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans 10, 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Romans 12, 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, Therefore the prisoner of, I therefore, Paul writes, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Philippians 4, 7 And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus, through Christ Jesus. Colossians 3, 15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. There we go with thankful again too. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. Hebrews 12.14 Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. James 3, 16 through 18. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. So God's wisdom is first pure, but then the very next attribute of wisdom is it's peaceable gentle and easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace tell me God's people are meant to be a bunch of uh, abortion clinic uh, picketing, a bunch of gay pride prick, uh, picketing. Supposed to be out there screaming at sinners, screaming at people that they're headed to hell. Tell me that we're supposed to be argumentative and debating, and we're supposed to be out there constantly stirring up. Stirring. No, the reason the world's in the shape it's in today is because the church is in the shape it's in today, and God's people are not a people of peace. 
That's right. Nor are they a people of righteousness. Anyone who encourages or inspires anything in God's people but peace is not operating in the Spirit of the Lord, and their message is not of God. You better keep that in mind. Titus 3, 1 through 3, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Isn't it funny? There are people out there who will scream and holler that certain people are fornicators and certain mm -hmm. people are committing fornication. And these same people are full of wrath. They're full of strife. These same people are full of things that the Lord also says are not acceptable and are not going to be part of the kingdom of Almighty God. Lastly today, peace. Now we know peace is one of the three attributes of God's kingdom. There's righteousness, there's peace. Lastly, I'm quickly, I'm trying to make it under an hour. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Now we just read Galatians 5, 19-21, which is what the the uh, works of the flesh are. But let's start joy in the Holy Ghost. Let's start in Galatians 5, 22 through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is in contrast to what the works of the flesh are. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Notice joy is second on the list. Notice peace is third on the list. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Remember what Paul said in our primary text, that if you follow after the things that the kingdom of God is supposed to be identified by, said not only will you be approved of men, but also, excuse me, approved of God, but you'll also be accepted by men. Hello now. Against which there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with all the affections and lusts. That means uh, the tendency to be hateful, the tendency to be angry, the tendency to be violent, the tendency to go with our most base emotions and our most base uh, reactions and yearnings. That's what it means when it says crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. It doesn't have to do with sexual lusts alone. It talks about all our desires as human beings. That they which do such things shall not inherit. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I'm talking about joy in the Holy Ghost. 
Acts 8, 5, 3. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. Listen. And there was great joy in that city. I'm going to tell you, when God's people act like God's people are supposed to act, and when God is able, see, God can't work through the church and do what God can do when His people aren't acting right. No. If we're not doing things the way we're supposed to be doing things, then God cannot work with us. He cannot work through us. You wonder why miracles are on the decrease. You wonder why. I'm 55 years old. When I was younger, miracles were commonplace. I started pastoring my first church 35 years ago. Miracles were commonplace. You wonder why healings and miracles are on the decline in the church. It's easy, folks. It is not the world's fault. It's the church his fault mm. if we were doing what we ought to be doing there would be great joy in this city there would be great joy in this country there would be great joy in our world because where the power of God is there is joy Acts 13 49 through 52 and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you something, honey. From somebody who's been in meetings where the power of God has fallen uh, in a manner that literally is, is similar to Pentecost. I'm going to tell you, where the power of God is, where the presence of the Holy Ghost is, there is joy. When the church acts right and God can work through the church like He wants to work through the church, honey, not only will there, will there be a greater manifestation of the Holy Ghost and the power of God, but there will be an outpouring of joy. Being full of the Holy Ghost and being full of joy are synonymous. To be full of one, you will also be full of the other. Where the Spirit of God is allowed to move and prosper, the joy of the Lord abounds. I hate to use this analogy, but you haven't ever felt a high like a Holy Ghost high. <laughs> Woo, my Lord, have mercy. Romans 15, 13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy, listen, and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. 1 Peter 1, 7 and 8, for those who run around claiming, oh, bless God, I haven't got no joy because I'm under persecution. Peter writes that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. I'm going to tell you, when I got happy earlier tonight, when we were singing that song, and I'm trying, I go, oh, hallelujah. I'm trying to read the words off the screen so I can sing them. And as I'm reading the words, they're making me happy. My spirit got happy. I began to rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I couldn't put it in words. I couldn't speak it. I couldn't I couldn't say it. I couldn't describe it. Oh, the best I could do was shout hallelujah. The best I could do was dance hallelujah. That's what Paul's talking about. Let me tell you, when God's church 
gets happy and the Holy Ghost gets to moving and you see people all over the church house dancing and rejoicing in the Holy Ghost. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. And as the old song says, and the half has never yet been told. Talking about persecution and Christians who complain, bless God, I'm being persecuted for my faith. Luke 6, 22 and 23. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy for behold your reward is great in heaven for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Oh I'm going to tell you the church doesn't look like the church is supposed to look church is supposed to have three primary attributes righteousness peace joy in the Holy Ghost our world is suffering today because the church is not living up to its obligation before God lastly and I'm closing right now Nehemiah 8 and 10 then he said unto them go your way eat the fat and drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry. Listen. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Righteousness. Peace. Joy in the Holy Ghost. These are the things that define these are the things that identify the church of the living God. Folks, if you see a bunch of people, I don't care if they call themselves Christians, I don't care what they call themselves. If you cannot define them by righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, then whatever they call themselves, they are not. Amen. Because there are three attributes of God's kingdom. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me today? I think.